Hello, how are you? Good to see you today. It's a beautiful, beautiful day, and I hope everybody's doing well this afternoon. Uh, we have a lot to be thankful for as we get ready to celebrate Thanksgiving as we do in our nation. Uh, man, we couldn't really be unthankful, could we? Not at all. We're just so, so thankful, so blessed we are as a people. I wanted to read some scripture, or at least a thought tonight uh, regarding uh, what pleases God. That's exactly what we need to be concerned with. I think sometimes we get more pleased, more taken rather, or involved with what pleases other people or pleases ourselves. But really, um, we can't really please ourselves, and we know we can't please others, but we can please God, and we can do that because of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, right now, for example, we're going through a lot of issues in our nation, as you know, with the election and the whole situation like it is. And But, you know, I, I was talking to a, a brother in Christ this afternoon, and we both agreed, you know, it may not work out like we want it, as far as the election goes, but we have to be reconciled to it's God's will. And we both agreed there's peace in that. That gives us peace to just believe. If we're going to be Christians, we're just going to have to trust God. And that's the greatest blessing we could have. But, you know, sometimes it's easy to say and hard to do. Here's a scripture. I'm going to look at a uh, verse or so in the book of Micah, the Old Testament, one of the prophets in the Old Testament. And it's a part, part of, uh, of church history or Bible history where God's people were, uh, were not pleasing him. And God lets us know, we know when we're not pleasing God. But the thing is, God tells us what's required of us to please him. And that should be our greatest thought, our greatest mind. I, I believe it is for you, and I know it is for me, and we want our hearts to be where God wants them to be. Uh, but we do know that we, that we struggle. You know, just like, say you have a faithful pet dog, and uh, he's, a, he's a wonderful companion for you. But as you train that dog, um, you might call him, you might want to wander off and play and frolic, you know, in the field and get his attention attracted. But when you call him back, he looks at you, you notice this, and he'll wag his tail and he'll look at you and then he'll he'll kind of think, that's his, he needs to come to his master, but he kind of runs off a little ways too. But finally he comes and, and he knows he's in the right place. His master's pleased too. We often award that with a pet or a hug. Well, you know, the Lord has, has saved us by His grace, and yet we still sometimes uh, forget that we need to be concerned about pleasing God with all of our lives. Here in the book of Micah, if you want to turn there with me, I'm going to look at chapter 6. This is a familiar verse you may have on your refrigerator. It would be a good one to put there. Uh, I saw it recently in a, in a restroom. It's a good place to put it, wherever we can just keep our mind on God's Word. That's exactly what we need to do. Uh, because the Word of God kind of helps us stay where we need to be. No wonder the Scripture tells us that the Word of God is a light unto our path, a lamp unto our feet, a light unto our path. It's a way that we see how to go. And, and I pray that this verse would help us. And may the Lord help us and show us to use it, not just to be a word, I hope you just don't think, well, I've heard a, some little preacher talk about a verse of Scripture, so I've done my duty. But rather, we see this verse with the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, not the letter of the Word, you know, just the reading of it, but the Spirit of it. May it sink in our hearts uh, this afternoon. Micah 6, 8 says, He has showed thee that he is God. He has showed thee, O man. Oh, man, is mankind, uh, men and women, uh, boys and girls, uh, people. He has showed thee, showed you, showed me personally, oh, man, what is good? You don't want to, you don't want to know what's good? Um, you know, we search for what's good, what's beneficial to our lives, what has lasting um, uh merit to it in our lives, you know, in our, in our world, we work, work, work for money or for position or notoriety, uh, but here's what's good. Here's what's good. Here is uh, what the Lord Jesus was talking about when he gave the 
analogy of the wise man that heard the word of God and he did it. He built his house upon a rock. That is what good is about. It's about building your life on good, okay? And then remember Jesus said in that account in Matthew, when the storms came, or Matthew 6 or 7, the Sermon on the Mount, uh, the, the storms came, the floods came, but the man that heard the word of God and obeyed it, his house stood. Whereas the person that heard it but didn't obey it, his house was like building on his sand. So what I want to talk about is how do you build your life upon a rock, upon what is good? Uh, we have enough of what's evil. So what is, what is it going to be to, to uh, build your house, build your life, on something that's good and God says to do it he uh, he has showed us what it is and so there's no excuse that we have and not not only that he emphasizes it deeper when he says in the next part of that verse and what does the Lord require of thee so God requires this of thee three things he requires of us Remember, God will never require anything of us that he doesn't enable us to fulfill. That is the gist of it. So we have, we have no excuse. Uh, just like we have no excuse to be uh, unthankful. We have no excuse really to commit any sin. We can't say, well, you know, the devil made me do it. Now, the devil does suggest that we do a lot of evil, but he never makes us do it. Um, when we think about uh, I didn't carry through with what God's called me to do we and we don't a lot of times we fail in a lot of ways but there's no way that we can say that that's something that was not our responsibility in most cases it is a is a requirement that God gives us because see God has given you and me the Holy Spirit and he is greater than anything else that's in this world that would tempt us to lure us off but the Lord says, does the Lord require of thee? And here they are, three things that we can do. That's my subject, my thoughts, my subject or title. Three things we can do that pleases God. Now, we know we have to do all three of them with faith because without faith, it's impossible to please God. And here they are. But to do justly, number one. Number two, and to love mercy. And number three, to walk humbly with thy God. Now, I believe that this scripture should mean to us that this is three things that you and I can do no matter what, no matter whether we have anything or whether we have a lot, uh, whether we're in pain or whether we're not, whether we're liked or whether we're not, whether we're in church or whether we're not. Um, whether we understand all the doctrines of theology or whether we don't. This is as simple, really, as Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so, and it does. What we better be thankful for is that God loves us enough to tell us what he's required of us and that pleases us. You have children. You've told them what you want them to do. Maybe sometimes not in words, but they know by your lifestyle and by your leadership in their lives as a parent what you, you require of them, okay? So, so that makes a difference because God has given us this because he is our heavenly father, okay? And we're forever his. And it ought to be really important that we please him or we do what he requires. And it pleases God just like it pleases you when your children obey you and do what you've told them to do. I remember not long ago, Penny and I went off for something and we come back and our granddaughter Faith had cleaned the dishes up. I just really was thankful. I gave her a hug. It pleased me. <laughs> so, I mean, that's just a small thing, but here's things that it's not like you know you have to do this to be religious it's what we do every day it should be our our mindset or our lifestyle to uh, 
to do justly, to love mercy, and walk humbly with our God. Now, the verse before this kind of sets the context, I believe, this verse 8. Listen to it with me. Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams or with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? In other words, uh, Micah is writing here under inspiration of the Holy Spirit that, that shows us that God is not really pleased all that much with sacrifices, the sacrificial system. I know it was a pattern and type, and it foreshadowed the Lord Jesus Christ, the final and total and complete sacrifice that he made for us, the one-time sacrifice that forever, forever paid for our sins. But, but he's showing us here that you can give a 1,000 rams or 10,000 rivers of oil. Does that please God? No, it doesn't. What pleases God? He says, not even, you mean I can give my children, my firstborn, for my sin? Do you know you couldn't even give yourself for your sin? You cannot pay your sin debt. Only God can pay that, and he's paid it in full in the Lord Jesus Christ. When is that going to get into our heart and mind? I'll tell you, when it does, we will be willing to love, to live justly, love mercy, and love to walk humbly with our God. And we really do because God has given us this principle when he saved us by his grace, but we sort of neglect that so much. And the devil's a culprit in that because he knows the great peace and the great fruit this kind of life lives. And he'll do everything he can to kick it around and make us get off track. Uh, but he says in that verse before, that sort of, sort of sets the context, doesn't it? That, that God is asking these questions. But then in verse 8, he says, this is what pleases God. So you want to know what pleases God? Here it is. It's to do justly, number one. What does that mean? Uh, first of all, it means that we do just as what God calls us to do. How do we know what that is? Two places. One is in this book, the Bible. God has given us a clear uh, description of how to do justly, righteously, um, to live a godly life, okay? In this book, it's written out, uh, over 800,000 words. That's what it's all about, to live like God wants us to live. He's told us everything he wants us to know about how to live, about life. Uh, and then the other place is he's written it on your heart. You have, a, you have a heart redeemed by God's blood, but you have a heart that's also written with indelible Holy Spirit ink, the law of God on your heart. That's why when a person is involved in sin, they don't want to get in this book much. Why? Because it convicts you too much. Uh, but yet we have this... this um, uh, energy, our spiritual energy, I call it this power from on high that God gives us, that we have a desire to, to live justly. That's why David, after he sinned with Bathsheba, and Nathan came to him, you remember, and, and he acknowledged that and told him, thou art the man. And, and David repented, and, and Nathan told him, the Lord has also forgiven thee. Well, you know, that wasn't enough for David. He still wanted to to do justly and to uh, love mercy and walk humbly with his God. And he did that. And Psalm 51 is really a psalm that deals with these three aspects of what God requires. That's why it's such a blessed part of Scripture. You know, that's the part of Scripture where David cries out to God and he says, I have sinned against thee, and against thee only have I sinned. One of those verses in Psalm Division 51 says, Create in me a clean heart, O oh God. Now, why was David saying that? He knows he's forgiven because his, his conscience was bothering him. He had committed a sin. And so he's, he's now to the point he wants to be so close to God because he loves him and he knows what requires uh, that fellowship, and that's doing things that please God. And when you do things that don't please God, we can't expect to have fellowship with him. 
And that's why we repent and confess our sins and, and the Lord cleanses us. But to do justly, to do what God has called us to do. Um, uh, the Apostle Paul talked about that in a sense when he said uh, godliness or, or bodily, he says bodily exercise profit is little, but godliness, that is doing justly, is not only profitable in this life, but for the life to come. In other words, when you and I take a, a time to live justly, uh, we're going we're gonna to carry it further than we are. But it also brings us much peace. Uh, for example, uh, while I'm thinking about it, uh, Psalm 15 um, describes living justly. Is this way you want to live? Listen to this. Lord, who shall abide in thy tabernacle? Who shall dwell in thy holy hill? I'm going to tell you, it's going to be somebody that lives justly, that is, according to godly standards. And then he describes that. He that walketh uprightly and walk, worketh righteousness and speaketh the truth in his heart. Now that is living justly. He that backbiteth not with his tongue, nor doeth evil to his neighbor, nor taketh up a reproach against his neighbor. That's a person that does justly. In whose eyes a vile person is condemned, but he honors them that fear the Lord. He that swears to his own hurt and changeth not. That is is a person that loves living justly and does justly. He that putteth not his money to usury, nor taketh reward against the innocent, he that doeth these things shall never be moved. Notice the do, the verb do in this, in these, uh, what is it, five verses only of this complete Psalm Division 15 is about living justly, and it's about doing justly. Well, that's what God says do justly. You can do it. You can do this. You can do it because God has given you his enabling grace, and it's something God requires you and I to do, and to please him. It's not like it's a work that we have to have to get to heaven. Uh, rather, it's a consequence of being saved by his grace. That's what it's about. So do justly, number one. Number two, look at that with me just a second and to love mercy. Now mercy, man, we ought to love mercy more than anything else. And we ought to love it enough to show mercy. You know, if you love something enough, you wanna share it with somebody else, don't you? And you'll go to whatever means you have to go to show that love and express that love uh, and to show your appreciation for that love. But he says, do justly one, love mercy too. Now, what is mercy? Mercy is not getting what we deserve. That's what mercy is. Whereas grace is getting what we don't deserve. That's, that's the two, that's the difference. So think about it again with me. M mercy is not getting what we do deserve. Whereas grace is, is getting what we don't deserve. In other words, uh, if you're going to, have mercy. We what do we deserve? We deserve to go to hell and live there eternally, if separate from God. Why? Because we're all sin. We've all sinned. We're all sinners. Um, so that means God has saved us by His mercy. Uh, that means we didn't get what we deserved. His grace, and that's a part of allowing us or enabling us to do what He requires. He gives us something to deal with this with that we really don't deserve. Man, God's grace is so much greater than, than any of our sins. We need to think, no matter what you've done, what I've done, we can have grace and we can just appreciate God's mercy. We ought to just love mercy. Now, you know, I mentioned the, the man that built his house on a rock, on the good things. That, that's God's word, Obey, obeying God's word. Uh, that's why we need to get around folks, if we can, that love God's word, that, that do justly people that love mercy. You're going to find these people are people that God has saved by his grace. People that have come to appreciate what being forgiven really means because we know where we'd be without it. But here's what it does. You have to, you have to do it. You have to practice it. It's more than just say, well, I love mercy. It's more than just having 
mercy on the back of your shirt or a tag on your car. It's about loving God and showing that mercy and really loving mercy enough to express it. One time years ago, I had a situation where mercy was profoundly a part of my response to a situation I had in a secular field. I had sold a track of timber, uh, taken bids on it. It was a personal track of mine. And I remember this one company bid a good bit more than anybody else. There's a big difference in his bid and the next bid. Obviously, I accepted it. And uh, the next day, he came in my office. And he came in. I remember him standing at the door. And he has, his hands were out like this, just figurative. And he says, uh, uh, Mr. Randy, I come today, but he said, I can tell you what I'm after, and it's mercy. Man, that got my attention. I know what he was going to say next. But he went, went to, on to explain to me that when he figured his bid to, to purchase the timber, he made a mistake. And he put more dollars on the volume, or more volume for the dollars, than was really there. So therefore... He had several thousand dollars more than in reality the value was. So to pay that, he was going to lose a lot of money. And so he said, I just, I'm just here for mercy. And then he told me, he says, I realize you don't have to do anything. And if I have to honor it, I will. But he said, I just want you to know I would appreciate your mercy. And, you know, had I not been forgiven for so many sins in my life, and had I not been exposed to the mercy of God, I might have said, you know, buddy, you just made the mistake. It'd be a good way for you to learn a lesson. And really, I needed the money pretty bad at that time. So uh, I could have easily said, you know, you just too luck, tough luck. Um, but, you know, tough love is not always the best love. Merciful love is always the best love. Because I told him, I, I, and what really sit in my heart, it wasn't in me. It was something within me that told me, you cannot make this guy pay this when you know how much God's mercy means to you. And you need to show that mercy to him. And I just felt like that was a call from God to do it, and so I did it. And, you know, years from now, I still see this guy every now and then, and I don't make a thing of it, and he doesn't either, but uh, I know that I think it meant a lot to him. It meant more to me, even. So that's how, that's how it is. You cannot give, out-give God. And, you know, it ended up to be for the best anyway. You know, God always has a way of, of taking care of us, you know, and providing our needs. But that's why he says these requirements are so important. Do you think God would ask us to love mercy if it was going to cause us to lose or to to lose something that God knows we really need? Absolutely not. So, so my point is, love mercy. You know, we need to love mercy so much. Uh, Lamentations talks about the mercy of God. It's like waves that are renewed every morning. Uh, you go down to the ocean, you see those waves keep flowing. You leave that afternoon and go back next year, those same waves. That's how God's mercy is. And you know, if God wipes the oceans the, the shores completely clear. You can write whatever you want to in the sand. You can write your name or you can write a slogan. You can build a sandcastle, but twice a day, God's going to clean all that up. Well, that's, that's what mercy does. Mercy ought to be the very uh, catalyst for forgiveness in our life. Mercy. You know, uh, the man that owed some talents or owed something to a man uh, he couldn't pay, and the man forgave him. And then the same man that was forgiven goes down the road and sees a guy that owes him something, not near as much, and he takes him and buys the throat, the scripture says, and says, I want you to pay me all. And the guy said, I don't have it, and he put him in jail. That lesson in the Bible is for us a lesson, you know, uh, that, that that's what unmerciful life will do. And God's not pleased with that. He's not. We need to be merciful. We need to love mercy. We need to love it so much that we respect it. And that, that doesn't mean that we just let everybody run over us. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about you'll know it because of 
the Bible and what's in your heart, you'll know when mercy needs to be paramount in your life or any situation. So do justly love mercy. And then thirdly, to walk humbly with your God. To walk humbly. Well, that ought to be a given. Given our creator, perfect, holy, the creator of the universe. Can you imagine him having anything to do with creatures like us? I can't. I really can't. But man, God is so good to us. We ought to just bow before him. You know, I was reading the other day about the... Uh, uh, the tenth leper, you know, the ten lepers that were cleansed, and only one came to Jesus. And and when he got there, that Samaritan, he the Bible says, and I never noticed this for some reason, he fell at his feet. He fell at his feet. He humbled. He was humbled himself. And you remember the story uh, in the Bible of the publican and the Pharisee. And that publican would not even go into the church, into the temple. He stood outside. Now, Jesus was listening to all this, and he beat on his chest, smote himself, the scripture says, and he says, Lord, have mercy upon me, a sinner. And you remember the, the, uh, the Pharisee was in there telling how many times he went to church and how much he gave and all oh, how his good things were. That might have been fine. But what pleased God, because Jesus says to the publican, or about the publican, this man went away justified. That's what pleases God. When you are honest with God, when you love living godly, and you really hate what God hates, you hate sin, you hate when other people sin, you don't do it in a condemnative way because you love mercy, okay? You see how these three go together? Um, they do, they, you, 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 you love, you do justly uh, what God says, you love uh, mercy and these are not things that are against your nature see God's given this new nature in you this is what actually you are about you love these things it's just that the world is so against it that we have to struggle with it and we ought not it would just be a spiritual natural for us all the time to do justly love mercy and walk humbly with our God you know Jesus says that there's two roads he described a broad road uh, like a big 12 lane highway so to speak it says there's a lot of people go down it uh, but it leads to destruction but he said there's a straight gate there's a narrow road with a straight gate and that straight gate is a gate you have to bow down to you have to humble yourself to go in and that is what God's called us to do because humility is how we grow faith humility is the soil that grows thankfulness and all the fruits of the Spirit. I can tell you for sure the one thing that God hates is pride. Now we think about things in the world today. We think about the lifestyle of the, uh, the gay and the lesbian or the riders on the street or drugs or things that we think we would never do. But the only reason we don't, don't is because of the grace of God primarily or we haven't had the opportunity maybe. But nevertheless, um, we, we need to see what God has given us and enabled us to know that he hates pride. That is, that is one of the things, Proverbs 6 uh, is very, very clear. Uh, you can think about abortion and all that. Those he also hates, but he does hate pride. And I'm afraid pride is one thing that we as Christians are more prone to be uh, pulled down with so to speak, but when we have humbleness uh, That w that means that we don't deserve anything from God We take what we have that God has given us We play the hand we're dealt and we want to say God I want to use this to honor and glorify you and that's all So we see in this verse this one verse Micah 6 8 those three important places in our life something we can do something we can love and a, some way we can walk. Now, walk means your lifestyle. We ought to, our whole life ought to be humbly. And I believe that Jesus Christ, on, on the day he went in Gethsemane's garden to pray before he went to the cross for you and me, exhibited exactly what pleased the Father. And he always pleased the Father. But here's what he said. He said, you remember, I pray, O Lord, that this cup could pass from me. 
Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. You hear what he's saying? He wants to do justly. He wants to live what, the way God called him to live. And he came to die for our sins. And he was sinless and perfect. He did justly. No doubt about it. But he said, love mercy enough to say, God, if there'd be some other way, that's okay. I would rather do it some other way. If there'd be some other way. Because he knew the suffering, the horrific suffering he was going through. But then he said, nevertheless, see that hum humility coming in, even with the Lord of glory, not my will, but thine be done. That's the humble mindset we should all have. I pray that God would help us uh, to see this verse as so important in our lives as Christians and giving us uh, something to, to really base our everyday decisions on. This is a practical, very practical verse uh, from the Old Testament. But I know you want to know what pleases God. I want to know what pleases God. And here's the three things. Do justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with your God. May he bless you and keep you very close to him and all of us as close together as we possibly can. Would you bow with me? Dear most precious Heavenly Father, we thank you for your holy word. We thank you, Lord, for your holiness. We thank you, Lord, for your Holy Spirit. We thank you, Lord, that we know that you're apart, set apart far above anything else we could think or imagine. We thank you for heaven and immortal glory. We thank you, Lord, for saving us by your grace. And we pray, O oh Lord, because of it all, what you've given us in our heart, what you've given us in our inheritance with you in righteousness and eternity, that you would bless us, Lord, to walk humbly with you, to love mercy and to do justly. Help us, O oh God. We do want to please you. And when we don't, Lord, teach us, as David said, to examine our hearts. And if we find some way in our life that we're not walking humbly, that we're not doing justly, and that we don't love mercy, that we'll come to you very quickly and confess it and bless your holy name and thank you for forgiving us and giving us another opportunity to do these things that not only please you, Lord, but please us as well. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.